Welcome to Advanced Data Analysis 1 with me, Eric Ehart, Professor of Statistics at the University of New Mexico. In this video, we'll start Chapter 8 on Correlation and Regression, spending much of this video talking about the logarithmic transformation and power laws, because this will be a valuable uh, transformation uh, throughout this semester and next. So here we are at the lecture notes, and I'm hoping at the end of this chapter that you'll be able to select graphical displays that reveal the relationship between two continuous variables, summarize model fit when you fit a linear regression, interpret model parameters such as slope, the um, de coefficient of determination, r squared, and assess model assumptions such as normality, linearity, things like that, uh, both visually and numerically by doing hypothesis testing. So first our introduction. We want to understand the relationship between two continuous variables, x and y. So let's, let's suppose that we select 10 people from a population of college seniors who plan to take the medical college admission test, that's the MCAT, and each will take the test and then will be coached and then take the exam again. So this is as in data from chapter 3 on the two sample t-test. Um, this is paired data, and we're going to treat X as the pre-coaching score, and then let Y be the post-coaching score. And we're hoping that there'll be an increase over time. So in Chapter 3, we saw how you could take the paired data, take the differences, and do a one-sample uh, test on the differences. In this case, we, we're going to relate X and Y, because perhaps there's a difference in how much you can increase from x to y depending on what x was. Perhaps if you scored low initially, you've got more space to increase than if you scored very high the first time. And so we want to understand how that increase or the, their post-coaching score, um, it depends on where they started. Okay? All right, so that's pretty much what those questions are asking. And we can answer those using correlation, which is simply how uh, linearly associated are the x and y scores, and also regression models, which actually will give you a an equation to relate how y depends on x through a slope and, and intercept. So let's start by talking about the correlation coefficient. This is a standard measure of linear association between two features y and x. All right, uh, we have some notation here. The Greek letter rho, which looks sort of like a smooth p, is used for um, correlation the po for, in the population. And that rho in the population, as the population parameter, will be estimated in the sample with the letter r, which is our sample statistic. To calculate r, we need pairs of data points. So for each observation, we'll have the pairs pairs of numbers, x1, y1, x, x2, y2, and so on, up through our last observation n. And for each one, we're going to compute we're going to take all of those numbers and compute what's called the Pearson moment correlation coefficient, product moment. Okay. We just call this correlation. When people speak of correlation, they're talking about this long name. And before I look at r by itself, we're going to look at a couple numbers we, we already are familiar with. Uh, let's start with s, y. So s is the standard deviation, and we know that that's the square root of the variance. And so inside this equation, which isn't highlighting quite pr perfectly, we've calculated the mean of y, and for each observation i goes from 1 to n, we take the difference between that observation and the mean, that's, you can think of that as a residual, sort of the difference from the mean, and square that number, and then add, and then do that for each value i, for each observation i, and add them all up, then finally divide by n minus 1, the sample size minus 1. Uh, it's minus 1 because we've, this is the number of degrees of freedom we have, and we've used 1 degree of freedom to calculate the sample mean. 
That gives us the variance. We take the square root. That gives us the standard deviation. So that's the standard deviation for y. Similarly for x, we can do that for all the x values. Now we're going to do something similar for something called the covariance between x and y. This says how x and y covary with each other. And if you, re if you replace y in this equation, for example, with x, then this is the variance for x. But instead, we have one term for x and one term for y. We take the mean for x, the mean for y, take the difference in the x direction, in the y direction, multiply those together, add them up over all i goes from 1 to n, and divide by n minus 1. And that is the covariance. Now above, we have a ratio. Uh, r is the correlation here. We have the ratio between the covariance and the product of the standard deviations. And in the equation on the right, all the n minus 1s have, have canceled out of the equation. Okay? So we have the, the numerator for the covariance term. Then we have the numerator for the variance term of x, variance term for y, and we've taken the square root. And that is the correlation between x and y. We're going to look at some pictures in a second. In fact, let me show you a couple pictures to, um, to be thinking about this. In the top left, we have perfect correlation. These points lie along a perfect line. and the So this is correlation positive 1, and this is correlation negative 1. Those are the most extreme correlation values you can have. Um, and the, the sign, either being positive or negative, just depends on the slope, whether there's a slight increase as, as x on the horizontal axis increased, does y also increase, or does y decrease? Okay, so that determines the sign. Um, below that is a strong correlation, but a weaker than perfect. This is uh, 0.7 and negative 0.7. Uh, you can see that the points have this upward trend, and that they're, but they're more spread out. And that correlation value is basically describing how much do the points describe, can be described by a perfect line. And the more spread there is, the lower the correlation. In the top right, we see that again, 0.3 and negative 0.3. There's lower correlation again. The points are much more spread, though you can still see an upward trend and a downward trend. And finally, in the bottom right, we have a zero correlation. Basically, the, a horizontal line would describe these data pretty well. And then we have a pattern on the bottom right, which is also a zero correlation, but there's a perfect relationship between these points. The point... The relationship just happens to be quadratic. And so because Pearson correlation measures linear relationships, uh, you can't model these data with a straight line. The best straight line here is horizontal, and so that's why we have correlation zero. But there is a perfect, cor perfect relationship here. So there are data situations where correlation is not a good description because a straight line does not describe that data. All right, let me page back up. We'll go through some of the properties of correlation. Um, for, uh, firstly, it's bounded between negative 1 and positive 1. Um, and correlation it can be positive or negative depending on that slope. Uh, perfect relationships are described at plus 1 and minus 1 for the correlation value. And the closer the points are to forming a straight line, the closer the correlation is to plus or minus 1. And here's an important point. If you transform either x or y linearly, the correlation won't change, meaning there's actually no units associated with correlation. And the reason for that, if I page up for a moment, is there are units for the covariance in the top, and there are units for the variance terms at the bottom, but once you divide here, you're, you divide away all the units. And so you end up with, so if things were in feet, or pounds or something, um, all of those units would go away. Which means that if you transform your, regardless of whether you measure something in feet or inches or centimeters or pounds or kilograms or Celsius and Fahrenheit, the correlation will be unaffected by the units of the data. All right. It also uh, doesn't matter which you call x and y for correlation because if I page up for a moment, um, if you swap x for y, this, this equation looks identical. All right, so I page back down. 
and we've discussed the plots and we'll get into logarithms now. So that is your uh, intro to correlation. Logarithms are super useful because there's so many situations in the world where things grow exponentially. Uh, in particular, there's a in any time where the mean and the variance of an observation grow together, uh, a logarithm often decouples the mean and the variance. It's very useful for us. So let's look at uh, log linear and log log relationships. Uh, we'll look at amoebas, squares, and cubes. So suppose we've got an amoeba, and this may be factually inaccurate, but let's use it as a thought experiment, that it takes one hour to divide. And so after one hour, so at time zero, you have one amoeba. After one hour, you will have two amoebas. And then each of those will divide in one hour more. And so after two hours, you'll have four amoebas, and so on. So what equation can we write for the number of amoebas y as a function of time x? So uh, the natural equation here is to have the n number of amoebas y equal 2 to the power x, because every hour x, the number of amoebas doubles. And so that's the, the power relationship here. We know uh, from calculus that if you take the logarithm of both sides, uh, on the left we have the log of y, and on the right we take the log of the base and then the exponent comes down. So here we have the log 2 and the exponent has come down as a multiplier. And if you just calculate what the log of 2 is, it's based at roughly 0.3. Perfect. So we can get um, a power relationship now as a linear relationship. So we've got y times, here's a slope, times x. This models a straight line. So we know how to model, we know how, well, at least very shortly, in the, probably in the next video, we'll know how to model things using a straight line, and we can use all that machinery um, if we take the logarithm of a power relationship. All right, let's look at a second example, see if I can keep enough of a previous example on the screen. So now suppose you have the same example, but now the amoeba takes three hours instead of one hours to divide at each step. Then you can calculate the power relationship this way. So it's, it's going to be hours divided by three. Every three hours it doubles and you can solve it in the same way and you end up with an equation of log y t equals um, 0.1 times x. Oh, I should say here that the the power of the log doesn't actually matter very much whether this is log 10, the natural log, log base 2, um, I have chosen, in this case, let's see, log 2, this looks like uh, log, this is looks like the uh, log base 10 to me, that we're using. All right, let's look at uh, another example. Uh, for power law relationships, it, it sometimes it makes sense to log both x and y. So, for example, how does the area of a square relate to its circumference or perimeter of the square. So if the side of a cube has length L, then the area is the length squared, and the circumference is 4 times L. Thus, the area is, so circumference divided by 4 is the length of, the, of one side, and it's that squared which equals the area. So this whole bit right here, circumference divided by 4, is L. L squared is the area. Okay, So we can take the logarithm now of both sides. So we have the logarithm of area times, you take the power and put that down in front, and when you take the logarithm of, of a ratio, that's the same as taking the difference of the log of the numerator minus the log of the denominator. And then you can solve for things. So minus log 4, that is negative 1.2 times 2 times the circumference. So now we have a straight line relationship on the log log scale. It's called log log because we've logged both the x, uh, sorry, the y side and the x side. 
and now we have a straight line relationship. All right. And we can do the same thing with the you know surface area of the vo and volume of a cube, for example. And I'll let you uh, go ahead and look at that example if you like. All right. Let's look at how the log transformation can be used in a few applications. Here's the world population. So consider what the world population has been over the last 2,000 years. So, and we're going to, we've got a, a table here, uh, which is here, and I'm actually going to scroll down and look at the data, okay? So the data appear on the left axis. So we have the population, and here we've got 2 times 10 to the ninth, so that's 2 million people. So each of these large grid lines is 2 million people. And we can see the relationship over time is growing like this. Right? We'll look at the plot on the right in a moment. Let's grow up and look a little bit at um, what this, what the data are. And all right, so there's some text there you can read. So we've got, uh, I'm going to read in this data into a table. So in the first column, I've got the year, and on the right, I have the population of people in millions. So, for example, in 2012, we hit 7 billion people. That's 7,000 million. And I'm going to create some new columns in this pop is the data frame. Um, so I've got year and pop M. I'm going to create another column called pop, which just multiplies the population in millions by 1 million so that I have the actual number of people estimated. And then using that actual number, I'm going to log 10, that number. So we'll look at the logarithm of the population over time. We're going to look at this function a lot more in this chapter, LM, which is to fit a linear model, a simple linear regression, where the logarithm of the population is the Y variable and the X variable is the year. So how does the population, the log population depend on year? And I have some other uh, um, details here that I'm going to skip over right now. We'll scroll down and look at the pl two plots of data. Uh, on the left we'll just plot the year as the x and the population as y. That's the plot we just looked at. The second plot on the right we're going to use the log of the population as the y-axis, and we're going to fit a straight line using method equals LM will fit a straight line to those data. And we'll plot those. And on the right, we have the data points as the black, uh, as, yeah, the black data points, and we have a blue regression line to those data. Now, the question is, we've We've got year on the x-axis and the log population on the y. So what is the growth of, of the population of the world? Well, if it was exponential on this log scale, it would be a straight line. And so this actually tells us that the world population of people is growing hyper-exponentially, faster than exponential growth. Okay? Exponential growth is already fast, but we've outdone ourselves. All right. One um, uh, note about this is when you're using data like this, you know, wh what is the source of information we're using to get those population numbers? For example, how do we know what the world population was in year zero or year one? No one was taking a census of the whole world back then. So these points are estimated and and you may, you may think a little bit about, about how much you need to worry about the quality of those estimations. Okay? I'm not going to question those right now, but in your own work, and when you think about the work of others, always be thinking about the data measurement process. How did they get this value? Um, is it even possible to measure that? Um, in the model that they probably used, are their model assumptions met? All sorts of questions come up. All right, let's look at uh, one more example having to do with log-log transformations. 
and for metabolic rates. So I've chosen this because I've worked with Jim Brown in the University of New Mexico biology department. And so I, I pulled some data from a paper of 2003 uh, that um, study biological scaling relationships. And th the relationship here that we're measuring is between body mass, which we call M for mass, and we're measuring that in grams. Uh, grams works very well because you can measure uh, tiny, <laughs> tiny organisms. And uh, you know, when you measure elephants and giraffes and things, you can, you can divide their kilograms down to grams. Uh, to get that number or multiply. And then the other is the basal metabolic rate. So in milliliters of oxygen per hour. So me metabolism, that's sort of how fast they're burning energy. And uh, it's possibly similar to watts, how much energy they're producing. So and the basal metabolic rate is, is their r rate at rest. So if I'm just sitting here, how much energy am I burning? Uh, in terms of milligrams of oxygen per hour. All right, so we've got different mammalian orders, and I'm actually going to scroll down and take a look at some of the data. There's a lot of uh, code here, um, but it, it's, there's not a ton of stuff it's actually doing. All right, so on, along the horizontal axis, we have body mass in grams. So um, the 1,000 is one kilogram. And along the vertical axis is base metabolic rate. And I, I don't have a good reference for, uh, to, for, to even help me sort of understand what that means. And I've, fit, um, I've got different colored points. You can see all these observations in the background. That's these different groups, uh, different types of mammals. Um, for example, these uh, lavender ones are rodents. I know that much. And these uh, light purple ones, which maybe also close to lavender, are primates. And here our groups are alphabetical um, by color, or <laughs> they're colored alphabetically, basically. And each black point is the, the average of these groups. Uh, furthermore, I've added um, in our labels the sample size of each group. So we know that there's 289 rodents represented and 25 primates, and only one of whatever this is. Uh, so I've calculated their means, and then I fit to the means, I believe, I fit uh, this curve. And uh, I'll actually sh say in a moment how I got this curve. But you can see that it starts going up, and then it starts to flatten out as it goes. And so this is actually a perfect situation where um, Jim, theories, Jim Brown has actually developed theory for how metabolic rate and body mass should scale together and um, this is basically that that relationship we're expecting now if we take the log of both sides notice we have a power uh, on that right hand side if we take a log we can actually express this as a straight line so I'm going to scroll down one plot and here's the data where I have taken the log 10 of the body mass as the x axis and I have the log 10 base metabolic rate and now, look at how nicely these points fall along this straight line. And here I have the equation for that straight line. It actually makes a positive prediction of metabolic rate when your log body mass equals zero, but that's when you're equal to one gram, right? If you were equal to one gram, that would be zero here. Um, and actually, the curve that I got ab above in the previous plot I took by first fitting this regression line, and then I exponentiated both sides to give me that curve, and then I plotted that curve. So that's a typical way to approach this type of problem. Fit a regression line on the log scale, and then exponentiate to see the curve on the original scale. And the third plot here, I'm going to zoom out a little bit, third plot is actually well, that's a little too far, but we'll take it for a second. Huh. Okay, that's good enough. Um, the po main point here are the axes, axis labels. So these are actually the same plots, 
Um, the plot on the bottom is has a little more breadth to it, meaning that I haven't cut off some points to the right and left, which I accidentally did up above. Um, the only thing I've done is relabel the axes so that instead of this being on the log scale, 1, 2, 3, now it's actually on the original scale, 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, and so on. So we have the natural units on the scale. So let me go up to the code for a moment and describe how those things that you saw in the plot were done. All right, good. There's only a little bit of code here. Um, I always put in comments, always, and this is for you too, um, put in comments for where you get data if you get it. Okay, so this was the data. I, there was a supplement involved. Let me scroll it, zoom in a little bit. Uh, there was the supplement, and um, here's the uh, citation that you can get at. And I downloaded, I think, data from the supplement, and I may have needed to work with this a little bit. Um, I don't recall now. It's been a year since I've worked on this. But I put the data into an Excel file, and the library G data allows you to read Excel files. So I load the library G data. You'll also need to install software called Perl, P-E-R-L, which is a program that G data re uses in order to read Excel files. Okay, so you install those two things, you can read an Excel file. And then I, um, so this is the file name, and I read the data in, and I've got some comments or some extra lines at the top that I'm skipping. And once I read in the data, which is which I'm calling bm.bmr, probably what? Um, bm, well, now I forget exactly what what that stands for. I bet if I scroll up to the example, I can figure it out. Body mass, oh, body mass and basal met metabolic rate, BMR. All right, that makes sense. Usually the things I do make sense to me <laughs> if I can figure it out. So I've read in those values. I've taken the log of body mass and the log of the base metabolic rate, and then I'm ready to go. So it turns out that there was one group that was, I think, really bizarre. So I took a subset of the data, and I excluded, with the exclamation point, I t um, everyone who was in this particular group. And I uh, took a sub uh, looked at the structure of the data. I fit a linear model of the log base, met base metabolic rate to the log body mass. Um, here are the coefficients. These numbers are what appear in those equations that were in the plot. And then I've got three sets of plotting functions. And I'm going to focus on the bottom two. All right. So the second one was on the log log scale. I'm, and here is the log variables right there. And I'm fitting... I'm plotting the points for all the observations. Genus equals ah. I've done some some calculations where wherever the genus was was empty, that was the mean for that group. So I plot the means for that for the group. I plot the individual data points. The smooth puts the regression line on there. And then I uh, label the title. And I've actually put the equation here. So the log 10 of the base metabolic rate is, and then I put in the coefficients. This is the slope, this is the intercept plus the slope times the body mass. So I've, I've, and I've pulled those coefficients for the regression model directly from lm.fit, which is, if I scroll up one page, lm.fit is from the linear regression that I fit. So I can put those coefficients right on the plot. The difference between the second and third plots were the scale of the axes. So here I've got the scale y and x, and I put some limits on there. On the third plot, there's also a difference in that second plot, I plotted the log of each variable. In the third plot, I plot the original variables but I scale the axes using scale x and y 
log 10. And that uh, scales the axes to show that plot. All right, so that was sort of a lot of information. I intend for you to have now seen that. And if you need to use those ideas later, these, uh, this will be, the notes will be here waiting for you when you need that help. All right, but that's the power of the log log transformation in using the logarithm in general. You can take a fairly complex um, exponential or logarithmic relationships and express those as a straight line, which are much easier to model using a using statistical framework, and then you can always um, transform back to the original scale if you want. All right, so I have some additional discussion here. I encourage you to read through that. And we will continue uh, the next video talking about test, uh, statistical tests for correlation and then move into linear regression.